Oren, hello. Good morning. So for those listening in, I'm here with Oren Etzioni. He is the founder and CEO of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And the acronym for that is AIAI. So it's often shortened to AI2. Um, Oren, how long have you been doing this? Well, it all started for me about nine years ago. There wasn't an AI2, but uh, the late Paul Allen's team reached out to me and said he wanted to create uh, an Allen Institute for AI. And it was up to me to come in, um, write a plan and make it happen. It sounded like an incredible challenge. I remember saying to people, people ask me, why are you doing this? You're fat, dumb, and happy as a professor at the University of Washington, tenured professor, you've got a good thing going. Why would you do something crazy like this? And I said, the sky's the limit with uh, Paul Allen's vision, with his resources, with his commitment to AI, we could do amazing things. And fast forward nine years, I feel like uh, there's a lot still to do, but we have done some good things. So I want to I want to dig deep into what the Allen Institute has been up to because um, it's kind of amazing how much you've accomplished in nine years, just the the impact and the unique way you've done it. But first, I want to I want to give people listening in a sense of who you are. So I had my Oren moment. Uh, I think it was 2018, 2019 at latest, and you came and you gave a talk in San Francisco, and you did a live demo, which is pretty unusual already of natural language processing, NLP. And the room was packed and I was one of many, you know, people at startups trying to make this stuff work and hoping to make it big. And, uh, you know, this legend walks in and gives a presentation uh, and you had it live on the uh, AI2 website, a bunch of models doing stuff. We take that for granted today that you would have models just running live, powered by GPUs. I, to my knowledge, you were the first doing it. And what was absolutely mind blowing was you would you would do what we all do, which is you'll show some some cherry picked examples, but then you did something that no one ever does, not then, not now. You then broke it in front of us. You would just say, "Yeah, looks impressive, right?" But let me just show you what happens when you change the wording of the input just a little bit. And you said this stuff barely works, and those words like seared into my brain, and they did a lot of good because it made me very skeptical and pragmatic so that when you actually got something to work, you didn't just say, you know, you didn't overhype it. And so, you know, that, that, that is you in a nutshell, straight, straight shooter. Just tell me like what you were feeling back in 2018, 2019, you were halfway through, you know, this, this grand project, you had laid the groundwork um, and you had contributed a ton to it. People don't realize that this whole obsession with Muppet names really began with Elmo, right? Right. Well, John, thanks uh, for remembering this and, and the demo and so on. I, I do feel like um, the principles that we have are, are what guides us through hype and turmoil and uh, ups and downs. And uh, that's the history of AI, but that's also the future of AI. So let, let me take the rich things you talk about and break them down. First of all, we have now uh, phenomenal language models that do quite remarkable and certainly very impressive things. But um, our colleague Kate Metz of the New York Times says, never trust an AI demo. So you're absolutely right that if you, if, uh, if you don't get to kick the tires, if you don't get to ask the right questions, then you don't really know uh, how well it does. And by the way, the best demonstration of that is actually in all of our living rooms with, or our, in our phones, right? With Siri and Alexa and so on. You ask Alexa for something, you can get a phenomenal answer. And then you change the wording slightly and it says, I, I don't understand that. So we have to be uh, very careful with what we impute to these systems. And of course, there was a recent brouhaha about, is this uh, Google AI system sentient? Uh, and and so on, and of course, uh, of course, it's not. So so I do think it is very important, as you say, to to, uh, to be a straight uh, shooter. Uh, and it's also true that one of my favorite sayings, because sometimes people tune in and they're like, "Wow, this is amazing." One another favorite saying of mine is, 
our overnight success has been 30 years in the making. So if you look at a model like GPT-3 or Lambda or the, the latest of the bunch, they do have a long history that goes back to BERT, goes back to Elmo, which you kindly remembered, which was invented uh, at AI2, won the best paper award in 2018, goes back to word to vec which came to Google, and actually goes all the way back to the 50s, where a uh, linguist, if I recall correctly, named Harris said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, right? It's almost biblical in, in the way he phrased it, right? And it explains most, most of NLP today. Exactly, exactly. That's the underlying principle that we can understand the meaning of words and from there the meaning of sentences and even beyond simply by looking at their context and looking at uh, a large number of contexts. So in some sense, uh, all of NLP today, uh, if I were told, stand on one foot and explain all of NLP today, I would say, uh, ye shall know the, a word by the company it keeps, but multiply that by a billion or 10 billion uh, companies, contexts, and you'll have NLP today. But it's pretty revolutionary, right? Because there was a whole period where we thought grammar mattered, like encoding the rules of grammar. We thought that was really important. I think that grammar does matter, but the remarkable thing about this technology, particularly when it's played out with large amounts of data, right, a billion, 10 billion sentences and large amount of CPU power, is that that data processing can recover the rules of grammar, uh, nuances of semantics, et cetera. So it's not that uh, grammar doesn't matter, is that this technology is remarkably good at at least approximating very, very well those rules that we have. And of course, by the way, we know that people only approximate those rules too, right? We often say things and write things that are ungrammatical, but kind of sound right. So uh, it's, it's really doing probably a better job modeling language than the rules of grammar. Before you got into uh, institution building, how would you describe yourself as a practitioner, scholar in the lens of today? You weren't an NLP guy necessarily. You weren't, you know, how would you describe yourself? I've always been fascinated with two questions. The first one is one of the most fundamental intellectual questions across all of science and philosophy. What is the nature of intelligence? How do we build an intelligent machine? Over time, I've also added the ethical question, which maybe we'll have a chance to get into. Should we build an intelligent machine? And what would that mean uh, for humanity? What would it mean for society? But th that's one part. And the second part of me that's a lot more uh, practical, the part that's uh, founded startups and that delights in uh, technologies is asked, how can we use AI to build valuable technology in search, in software agents, in natural language processing? What was that conversation like, that early conversation with Paul Allen, where you were making this pitch or was it he making this pitch? Did you come to it together? How did, how did it come about? And uh, for those who... You know, there might be some in the audience who don't know. Paul Allen is the co-founder of Microsoft, sadly passed away pretty recently, um, but an intellectual maverick. He absolutely was an idea man. And that is the title of his autobiography, which I really recommend to people. It's uh, really worth reading. And I think that uh, his key role in Microsoft, particularly early on, was to have that vision of the PC revolution and, and what it would mean. It's hard to imagine now, right? We've got a, a computer in every pocket and in our eyeglasses and, you know, 200 computers in our car. But back then, right, uh, computers were far from ubiquitous. And the idea that we'd have a computer uh, on every desk was completely revolutionary. So, so Paul Allen was a visionary. And uh, I found talking to him incredibly inspiring, right? And I'm not paid to say that. The, the, the poor man has is, is, is passed away, but he is and will always remain one of my absolute heroes and um, not idol, but uh, inspirations, mentors for his relentless focus on, you might call it the prize. And the prize not being a billion dollars or a trillion dollars, the prize being how do we understand uh, intelligence? And of course, he had a whole nother institute, the Allen Institute of Brain Science, that was dedicated, that is dedicated to understanding the brain. It's like the wet lab side of this. Exactly. Somebody once asked him, 
Do you think that the neuroscience approach, the wet lab, is going to be successful in the long run, or is it going to be um, the more software-oriented approach that we use in AI? And he said, look, to me, it's a horse race, and I've got a bet on, on, uh, on both horses. So, so what was the race, though? Did he want artificial general intelligence? Did he want to just crack the scientific mystery of what it is? Did he want to harness it? Like, what, what did those pitch meetings look like? Paul was fascinated, and I continue to be, to be fascinated by two related questions. The first one is absolutely the most hairy, audacious, big question you could ask, which is, what is the nature of intelligence and human level intelligence? You know, no uh, consolation prizes, the real thing. And so he was always asking us about that. He was always relentlessly looking to the future and saying, okay, what would it take to get there? How can I help you? Uh, does this scale? The second thing, and I think it comes from his fascination with uh, human knowledge. Uh, his mother was a librarian. So he was fascinated with how do we collect human knowledge and how do we get a computer to understand it? Back in the uh, 70s, I believe, early 70s, he said, look, it's one thing to take a book, collect all the words in the book and put them in an index, effectively what today we call a search engine. And it's quite another thing to understand the meaning of the book and answer the questions at the back of the book. Think of uh, exercises at the end of each chapter in a textbook. And so even in the 70s, before a lot of this technology was around, he understood that meaning, understanding the meaning of, of text, of, of knowledge, was very, very tough for a computer. I mean, have we even gotten closer, though, or are we fooling ourselves? You know, what I think about is... I use semantic search all the time, just at work. It's a, it's a great tool. It's really powerful, but it's so easily fooled. You sort of crack through the shell and you realize if this thing understands, scare quotes, what it's reading, it's doing it in a very different way from me because I could just change a single word inconsequentially to me and it just falls apart. It clearly doesn't understand it the way I do. So are we, are we chasing up the wrong tree when we say we're chasing un text understanding? Or is it all just performance-based? We don't really care if it understands. We care about getting jobs done. Find me documents that are about, you know, four-legged animals that love to bark. You know, if, if I didn't know the word dog, but I knew what I was, I could describe what I was after, we would love a computer system that would just find the right stuff, even if it had no idea. And I don't care if it has any idea, let alone feelings about what I'm searching for. Well, John, you're asking the most profound uh, question at the heart of this field. I'm not sure I can answer it in uh, 25 words or less, but let me uh, let me take some shots of go on goal and it'll be more of a dialogue. So to the question you asked, is it performance-based? Uh, the first answer is that our performance has gone way up, right? So if you take any objective measure, and, and there are many, uh, and back in the day we were interested in, can a computer answer uh, an eighth grade test, right? The region science exam. Uh, the SATs, and initially the answer was a resounding no. It did little better than uh, chance on multiple choice questions. It was getting close to 25%. And fast forward, now it can get 80 or 90%, you know, better than the uh, most high school students. And I really wonder how it's doing it. I really wonder. Well, so, so we know. We have a lot of uh, insight into that, and I'll get to that in a second. But to take the performance question uh, we can check the box. We now have exceptional performance. But now we're debating, as, as you're raising, the question of, okay, so what does that performance mean? And uh, there's a famous saying from you know, Herb Dreyfus, uh, the late philosopher from Berkeley, who said, look, we've uh, uh, run up to the top of the tree and we're shouting that we're on our way to the moon, right? Uh, we, we, it doesn't scale. And it's not really uh, a way to do space flight. We just you know, climb the tree. So, so I, I uh, right, right. So again, the uh, that metaphor is not drawn to scale, right? It's 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 more than uh, a tree, but still, the technology that will get you to the space station, you know, to kind of riff on this metaphor, may not be the technology that gets you to Mars, and certainly not the technology that gets you out of the solar system, right? So, um, so I think that when we talk about uh, competence, when we talk about uh, genuine understanding, there's a real debate uh, in the field. And there are some people uh, like Gary Marcus, who is brilliant and pointing out um, how this technology falls short. 
and we can see that these large language models do things that are called hallucination. You ask it questions that are meant to trip it up, like who was the president of the United States in 1492? And it'll answer something like Columbus, right? It, it won't realize that uh, the United States didn't have, didn't exist in 1492, didn't have a president then. So there's hallucination, there's lack of robustness, right? You paraphrase the question. And if you ask me the same question in different words, most likely I would say, hey, John, that's the same question. I'm going to give you the same answer. But uh, AI technology uh, will not. And by the way, by the way, that was a perfect demonstration of ye shall know a word by the company it keeps. You know, the machine sees the string 1492. It, it basically has seen enough. It, it knows you want to look for a person. Columbus pops right up. And so that's, that's a case of the dumb pet trick with data failing you. That, that's exactly right. The, the remarkable thing is every time we identify um, uh, a trap like this, a phenomenon, a, a place where AI trips up, well, our, our uh, colleagues who are um, deep learning gurus just get more training data, just modify the training regime, and they solve that one. And so we're exactly. So is it is it a game of whack-a-mole, or is there a, a fundamental paradigm that goes all the way to, to human le level intelligence? I would say that that's the question of the age. And I would look to people who are a lot deeper into deep learning, pardon the the inadvertent pun, like uh, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, right? They're Turing Award winners. And I would say that they themselves, while they're very much enamored of deep learning and this kind of paradigm, say that the current underlying algorithm, the current algorithms, I should say, backpropagation, supervised learning, current neural network architectures, don't take us all the way there. They see uh, the limitations of the current technology, but they do see that the paradigm, this uh, distributed computing with simple computing elements and weight updates on edges between them is the foundation for a much more sophisticated architecture that will get us all the way there. And of course, if we look to the brain, right, neural networks are a gross, gross simplification of the brain, but we do have an existence proof, right? We do know. There's an N of one, N of one. Exactly. So here's a great quote from you. Um, that is a good seg to dive into the AI2 impact. So you said AI2 is the place to do work that companies won't do and universities can't. So I think that really, to me, captures the weirdness of this thing you built. It is neither a university nor a company. What is it? Well, uh, first, to give credit where credit is due, which is always extremely important in academia, right? we don't do it for the money debt, is a quote that, that I uh, repeat from my colleague Noah Smith, who's a professor at UW and uh, a, yeah, a, a leader at AI2. But it's a wonderful characterization of, uh, of what we do. And, and sorry, John, so, so repeat the question. How do we do it? Why do we do it? I'm, I wasn't sure. No, more like, what is it? Like, it's this strange hybrid. Uh, it's had all this impact, but without any of the benefits or problems of being a company, nor any of the benefits or problems of being a university. It's like, I, I don't know many things that like it. Also, you've tagged on an incubator to it now. So it's like definitely unique. So uh, I'm a product of the university system. I was a grad student. I was a professor for more than uh, 20 years. And I, I love that system for uh, intellectual exploration for intellectual freedom, uh, for uh, the kind of uh, debate and surprises that it produces. But it does fall short when you're trying to build systems. Some problems require a sustained effort over uh, some number of years, requires uh, engineering sophistication. And it's hard to do that with students who, who need to graduate. And actually, it's not, it's not even fair to ask uh, students to, to play engineer for years on end. Right, because you have to worry about their education. Exactly. That's that's the primary uh, goal. So over time, over my 20 plus years at university, I did rue sometimes how, gosh, we really want some things to go into the real world and get more sustained investment than just tossing them over the transom, writing a paper, writing a research prototype, and hoping that somebody will pick up the ball. So at AI2, where we have researchers and engineers working shoulder to shoulder, and that's an important part of it. It's a, 
egalitarian community. It's not the case of the researchers up on top of Mount Olympus and they're cracking the whip to mix the metaphors of telling engineers, do this, do that. It's much more the case that they're collaborating. The engineers are telling them, look, here's what you need to do to build uh, a working system. We have Semantic Scholar that, John, of course, you're intimately familiar with. You've written about, uh, you, and you were one of the folks to first uh, announce it to the broader community when you were writing for science and so on, which was which was wonderful for us. So something like Semantic Scholar, which to those who don't know, it's a free a search engine for scientific content. It has, uh, you know, it's approaching 100 million users a year. Uh, it has 200 million papers in its corpus. That sort of scale and running AI at that scale requires a lot of engineering. And we have a very strong engineering team, folks who came out of Amazon and Google and uh, other places uh, to be able to do that. And you just could not build Semantic Scholar, build it, sustain it, iterate on it in a university. You could build a prototype. Actually, you know what a good comparison point is, is uh, Archive. So Archive grew out of the university system. It's sustained by the university system. And you can see how far you can get with a, a system. You know, Archive and Semantic Scholar are like worlds apart. Semantic Scholar is a full product with, you know, incredible amounts of, of hand engineering in it and maintenance and users. And, you know, I think Archive is about as far as you can get a preprint server. That puts PDFs on a website, and and even archive is an exception, right? It's it's uh, it's it's rare that you have. It's a gem. It's a gem. Yes, absolutely, and it, but it's rare, as you say, that you have a university system that can operate uh, at uh, at very large scale. So, um, and then uh, on the other hand, we have no profit motive. Semantics uh, Scholar does not have a business model. I don't think there's a good business model in that space because it's it's meant to be free. I know you have opinions about academic publishing. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we can get into that if you want. But uh, yeah, I think uh, too much money is made in uh, uh, for uh, over things that really ought to be free to, to benefit humanity. And maybe to bring this uh, full circle to the late Paul Allen, um, our mission is AI for the common good. So that's why I, I say, you know, universities can't, but companies won't. Companies appropriately, right, have the mission, their, their for-profit mission. But uh, Paul Allen is a major uh, philanthropist. And he won Philanthropist of the Year Award a few, a few years before he passed away. Um, he wanted to make the world a better place. The Allen Institute of Brain Science released a free brain atlas that was a, a tremendous resource, uh, catapulting research in that realm. And our mission has always been to bring to the fore and release uh, systems, data sets, uh, open source software that uh, help to bring the field forward. So what's up with this incubator then? Is this, is this uh, so the, what, from what little I know about it, you have added a startup incubator to AI2 so that ideas, I presume, can spin out and have a chance to be nurtured. Is that, uh, is that you hedging against like sometimes actually companies are the right way to solve problems? Or is it, like, what is that? Is it for the future health of AI too? Not, not really. So from, from day one, we had an incubator in recent times uh, with a, yeah, yeah, it, it started, our very first startup, uh, Kit AI, it was actually started in, you know, 2014, 2015. Oh, how did I miss this? It's yeah. just not well but, known. Well, because it was very small. And then once we got the right leaders in place, it's grew, it's grown and grown. And now we're approaching uh, three quarters of a billion dollars in the total valuation of companies founded and acquired our company Exnor, which was a computer vision at the edge company, um, was, was acquired by Apple. And uh, we've done now more than 20 companies in the pre-seed stage. The, the analogy is to think of a university and their commercialization uh, center. So University of Washington, where I was, has one. Stanford has one, of course, that famously created Google and Yahoo uh, and other, other major companies. And it's actually, in my mind, a natural part of the life cycle of universities that some ideas and technologies that are created in a very nascent, you know, incipient form in the university, it makes sense to transfer them to a for-profit context. And that's where you both get the resources to make them shine, right? To take them uh, to the next level. And also um, you, you get the opportunity, right? Uh, to, to create value. 
and value creation in my mind is a, is a great thing. I'm not in any way a socialist thinking, oh, we should all just be working for the common good. I think some of us should be working for the common good, and I feel very privileged to be in that position. Some of us should be uh, in startups figuring out how to revolutionize the world and uh, make a killing uh, at it, even though I disagree very strongly with, say, Elon Musk's views uh, about AI, I very much uh, am blown away with his success with Tesla, right? So uh, we wouldn't have Tesla if we didn't have for-profit startups. Hang on, which part do you uh, disagree with? The uh, the robots are going to kill us? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Elon Musk is famous for having said with AI, we're summoning the demon. And I, and I think that's just... Uh, that's hype. And actually, the worst kind of hype. It's hype from somebody who you think uh, w- would know better, right? He's such a brilliant uh, man. If He gives a lot of credence to, to statements that are just not rooted in, in any data. Although he's not alone. There are a lot of pr- uh, cautious voices. He's just uh, the biggest on Twitter. He's the biggest and he's, you know, the most art- art- articulate. But I, I do agree with you. There's an interesting conversation uh, around this issue. Uh, I feel very strongly that we don't have any basis for some of these uh, fears about AI. I've written about this. Uh, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, right, you've had the own experience. Anybody who's built an AI system knows just how much blood, sweat, and tears uh, we put in to eke out the, the modest level of performance that we get, uh, let alone this AI that's free form, you know, taking over humanity can't be turned off that we see in uh, in Hollywood movies. So I think it's really important to distinguish science from science fiction and hype in Hollywood from from the reality. Other people just extrapolate more strongly for the future. They have ideas like hard takeoff. Sure, AI is not very powerful now, but what if you uh, uh, turn your back on it? What if all of a sudden there's a sharp uh, increase. Uh, you know, you leave for the weekend and you come back and on Monday, this you know, fat AI, like... Your toaster's in charge. Exactly. It's smoking a cigar and saying, I've been expecting you, Dr. Etzioni. Uh, and and it's just, uh, it's, it's not realistic, but to understand that, you have to uh, get a lot more technical. I, I do want to share uh, two metaphors that I think help that. One is these technologies that we're talking about, where we tune the uh, edges on we- um, the sorry the weights on edges in a neural network, which is what our deep learning technology is doing. That technology is the moral equivalent, if you're not a technical person, of adjusting the gain and the equalizer and various buttons on your stereo. And there's a except you have billions of dials in this case. You have billions of dials. You're adjusting them automatically. But after you've adjusted them really well, it's still just going to be a stereo. There's no way that you find the right adjustment on lots of dials on your stereo that will become the Death Star. It's still going to be a a stereo. The same with these large language models that, again, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of, are are they sentient and so on. Those large language models are basically mirrors. Okay, They mirror by collecting this corpus of all these uh, words in the company they keep. They mirror that collected discourse back at us. And when we look at the mirror, we see we can see glimmers of intelligence because we see reflection of our own discourse. The thing that's important to realize about a mirror technology is that you can scale the mirror. You can have a very large mirror, but a very large mirror is not going to turn into a Death Star. I, I definitely agree on the second point. Um, I think of these large language models as data telescopes. They're just amazing, amazing devices to look back on all this amazing data we ourselves created with language, which is its own mystery. So really, we're just looking at our own mis- mystery. But on the first one, I would say um, biologists, you know, so you said, hey, it's just a big stereo. You know, it may be impressively large and it may be twiddling its own dials, but it's still just a stereo. And I think a lot of biologists would say, well, you know, I can show you a cell that, you know, an amoeba that uh, is really just running around trying to gobble up food and, you know, make more amoebas. Um, And it's not that different from a neuron. It's really just a a lot of very strange um, natural history that led to the the job of being a neuron as a cell. And yet when you add them all together, you know, you get walking, talking goofballs like you and me. 
And so you, either you admit that we're not that special or you admit that there's something special in the system. And so, but that's all, that's basically kept uh, philosophy grad students uh, in business for <laughs> all time. But I do want to address your comment because I think it's an important one. And where I would take exception is with the word add. So cells are the basic building block of life, uh, guaranteed. Uh, neurons are the basic building block of the brain. We have neural networks. The units in neural networks are actually very, very much uh, simplified relative to a neuron, but never mind that. I would accept that perhaps we have discovered some of the basic building blocks, but it's not the case today that I can give you a cell and say, here's a cell, make me a human right? Uh, uh, far, far from it. And that we understand. Uh, Unless, of course, that cell is a fertilized egg. Sure, sure. But <laughs> it turns out to there, be pretty easy. <laughs> well, that's that's the natural process, right? And we're going to keep this uh, uh, PG rated, John, right? So uh, uh, what, what I'm saying is that uh, we don't know how to artificially produce a cell. And even if we did, we wouldn't know how to turn that cell uh, into a human. And uh, so even if we had a neuron, right, even if we could build, simulate a neuron in a computer, we don't know how to turn that into a brain or into human level intelligence. So the organizing principles are still uh, what was lacking. And one last point, because this is something I'm so passionate about and actually gets uh, lost sometimes in all the hype and all the excitement about the technology. The one other point I want to make is even if somehow we came up with a recipe, a mechanical process to produce a human by cloning, right? To produce an intelligence by doing the uh, AI equivalent of cloning. We still want to understand. We want to understand the organizing principles of how do you build a human? Uh, we want to understand the organizing principles of how do you build an intelligence? So we can fix problems, so we can go uh, beyond it, so we can use these technologies for the common good, right? To cure diseases, to solve problems. And also to know ourselves in a deep way. Exactly. All right. Let's 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 swerve for a sec. I, I really don't want to run out of time before we dig into some of the cool stuff that's actually happening at AI2. So, you know, back to that point about AI2 being a place where you can do things that companies won't do and universities can't. Let's dig into a couple of them. So over the years, you've been absolutely swinging at the fences with, you know, attempts to make uh, an AI system that can solve math problems where, you know, that's not directly, you know, to your point about companies won't do it. You're not going to make a buck out of a, uh, a, at least directly out of an AI system that can pass eighth grade math tests. It's not relevant. Uh, no one's going to pay you millions of bucks for that. But a university can't do it because taking, taking a look at the papers you guys are producing, the infrastructure required to get there is monumental. So what are, what are some of the big swings at the fence that you've been doing that excite you lately? Well, um, so Semantic Scholar is the biggest one, right? Where we have a scientific search engine built from the way down. We are in the process of releasing a sub-project of that uh, headed by uh, Dan Weld, who uh, was a professor for many years at the University of Washington, now uh, joined us to uh, lead this project. Uh, uh, it's called the Semantic Reader. And that is basically when you're reading papers, right? I feel like if you want to think about the history of reading scientific papers, okay, we had the cave wall, then we had the printed page, then we had uh, PDFs you can read online, and not much progress since then, right? We still kind of uh, labor over PDFs. Uh, well, the semantic reader allows you to seamlessly look at citations while you're in text, to look up definitions for terms uh, in line, to... Uh, do a lot of uh, things, I don't have time to describe, skimming, um, things that make the process of reading a scientific paper that much more efficient. And we... So is this like a machine reading over your shoulder and like taking notes for you? Not that sophisticated. It's much more of a tool, right? So think of Acrobat Reader++. Plus Plus. It's souped up to make it easier for you uh, to read. So... Uh, here's a very concrete example. Something that we're very proud of is we've used language models to create TLDRs, 
one sentence summaries of, of papers that are really quite high quality. These have been published and measured and they're really quite good. So often as you're reading a paper, there's references to other papers and you're like, what do I do? Do I click on that? And suddenly I'm reading another paper and they have a reference and I go down some kind of uh, uh, infinite rabbit hole. Exactly. Infinite rabbit hole. Or do I, you know, note it down, but then forget about it? Well, with a semantic reader, you can hover over that reference and get a, a, a TLDR it says, okay, that's what that paper is about. And you can make a quick decision. Hey, let me make with one click, I'll save that in my library for future reference. Or no, nah, that's not really what I'm interested in. I'll, I'll, I'll ignore it. So uh, just little uh, affordances, little um, uh, tricks that are enabled by AI that allow you to focus better and just be more efficient at, at reading the paper. And because is the secret mission here to make uh, AI researchers better at doing AI with the help of AI in a flywheel? <laughs> is, this the, is this a virtuous cycle? It's meant to be, but it's to make scientists uh, across all disciplines better, better at their job. So if we can make uh, scientists across biomedicine, people working on climate change, what have you, if we can make them 10% more efficient, uh, that, that is uh, significant. And potentially we can make them a lot more efficient, right? If I uh, give you a TLDR that spent, you know, saves you an hour of groveling through the text or even better, allows you to pursue something that you might, uh, uh, might have missed. Let me give you actually another example. We all now use adaptive feeds. We just don't call them that. Our Twitter feed, right, is automatically organized by an AI that studies us. Our Facebook feed, some people use. And of course, email in that readers. case, the motivation behind the algorithm is to make you click on ads and spend exactly. money. Exactly. Exactly. So you're so, doing the same thing, but with a, a higher purpose. That's exactly right. So we have a feed for scientific papers, and you can train it. It'll show you new papers that you might have missed that might have result that might result in amazing breakthroughs. And you'll tell it, "I like this. I don't like that. Yeah, that's interesting to me." And it'll automatically compute tomorrow's feed when new papers came up in archive and elsewhere uh, to to help you in what's ultimately a needle in a haystack search, right? Finding that key result that you, with your human intelligence, connect with another uh, result and, and have this amazing breakthrough. So yeah, case in point of what you're saying, the entertainment fees we have have a profit motive, but who has the motive to help you be a better, more successful scientist uh, in whatever your field of study is. AI too does with AI for the common good. Cool. All right. Give me a second big bet. Something, something crazier. Well, uh, we have uh, scientists working uh, to fight uh, illegal fishing using computer vision. So uh, there's a lot of satellite data, uh, but uh, smaller countries don't have the resources to analyze that data and identify uh, illegal fishing boats that are uh, impacting their country's livelihood and so on. So we've uh, saddled up to help solve that problem recently with a pro it's called Skylight. And uh, we, we just won a uh, national competition uh, that was actually run out of the government f to have the who's got the best tools for analyzing the satellite data. Uh, and AI2 came in uh, first in the U.S. We're very uh, proud of that. That just happened uh, a few months ago. Uh, we are engaged in using deep learning for climate modeling. We're very interested in the problem of how will precipitation rain, right? How will that change as climate changes in an unprecedented fashion? That's incredibly important for agriculture, for irrigation, for making decisions uh, about the sort of infrastructure you need to keep us fed, right, as, as the climate changes. Well, uh, we're using the same types of models to help make these, uh, these sorts of predictions. But really the craziest... Uh, sorry, John, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask... Um... I had recently heard that deep learning had found its way into weather modeling, and uh, I didn't read enough into it to understand how. It kind of baffles me. Why would you use a neural network to make you know, such a model? But at the end of the day, it is just prediction, and deep learning is the ultimate prediction engine. That's exactly the answer. Uh, whenever you have a lot of data and you want to make a prediction, we've learned that deep learning models are uh, um, almost invariably really, really strong. But I want to get to the craziest project, and maybe this is what you're uh, alluding to, and that's the problem of common sense. So that's a problem that's been a holy grail for AI. How do we build a machine that has common sense? It's been a holy grail of AI for decades, but there really hasn't been much progress on it. 
until recently, where Yijin Choi, who's a professor at the University of Washington, shares her time uh, with AI2. She's leading a team that, that works across both organizations to figure out how to endow computers with common sense, how they can, you know, if I ask you, can an elephant fit through a doorway? You would say probably not. If I ask you what's bigger, uh, a nickel, right, the coin, or the sun, you would say, or you're being silly. Why, why ask me these questions? But if you ask that question of most computers, they don't know, right? They don't have the kind of human experience you have. I think it actually goes deeper than that. I think that's just a great demonstration of the lack of common sense. But this thing that I, you know, bedevils NLP work every day of you change one inconsequential word and the model just has no clue suddenly, it all maps back to a lack of common sense. And I, I want to highlight again to go back to this fundamental question about should we be worried about AI? I think that common sense and common sense ethics are actually really important here. So one of the fanciful scenarios that people love is the notion of you tell your computer to produce paper clips and it goes crazy, kind of a magician's apprentice type of scenario. And it uh, produces, you know, it kind of takes over all of humanity's resources to maximize paperclip production. And we all die in the process, right? There's no food, there's no energy, there's just paperclips. Well, what is that if not a tremendous lack of common sense and of ethical sense? So if we want to uh, work towards having machines play a better role in our lives, it makes sense to start working on these problems now, but in a constructive fashion, not in a philosophical fashion or a, uh, oh my gosh, you know, chicken little the sky's falling fashion, but to say, okay, how do we build into computers the sense to not cause harm? And this is the alignment problem that people often talk about. How do we align AI with what we should be caring about for our own good? Yes, although it's an important twist. So the alignment problem really comes from a tradition of reinforcement learning where uh, ethics and values are reduced to a number. And you say, you know, I I've got the number 15 for some world. John's got the number negative 15. How did John and I or how did the computer and I align our numbers? But that, in my mind, is actually a gross oversimplification because how do you build something that figures out what are the right actions, figures out how to evaluate uh, a situation, right? We often find ourselves in moral quandaries. We often make mistakes and then recover from them. So you say common sense is the, the first mountain to climb before all others. Uh, it's certainly a, a necessary mountain to climb. Uh, I, you know, I never want to like say the problem that I'm working on takes primacy on other people's problems. But I would say that traditional value alignment and reinforcement learning is, is grossly oversimplified uh, and ultimately inadequate for, for common sense and for moral reason. And so um, Gijin is, is tackling common sense. What are, what are the angles of attack on this? Well, so one of the huge questions that, that we, we touched on is, is our neural networks enough? Do you also need to create uh, symbolic knowledge? You know, thou shalt not kill, right? Is, does that have any uh, any value? Do you, can you just use sentences from the internet, which can be, as we know, toxic, full of uh, sexism, racism, xenophobia, uh, anti-gay sentiment, and also mutually exclusive claims about everything? Exactly. So, are, is our moral sense going to come from just? Uh, a large and arbitrary collection of sentences, or do we have different ways uh, to build a moral sense in a more uh, responsible fashion? And so, so those are some of the questions she studied. Uh, and again, it's it's a it's a very rich project. Is language enough? What about uh, should we put in robots? Should we put in computer vision? Can we learn from videos on YouTube? Right, there's a lot to learn. Language is just a limited data stream, so a lot of the work is now becoming multimodal. So what do you think is the best bet we have today for making any progress on common sense? I mean, so far, I'd say the, the most impressive work has just been in creating better benchmarks to reveal how far we are from true common sense understanding. That's actually been a great project across the world. It's just showing our laundry with benchmarks that are actually challenging enough to show that, no, no, we, we really are miles away. We're at the top of the tree, nowhere near the moon. So I, I think that there is a lot of value in that, and I think that uh, continues. 
there is a funny phenomenon that when you build a benchmark that's large enough and the community kind of demands, right? We uh, learn arguably from relatively few examples, but here they say, hey, if you don't have, I don't know, at least 100,000 examples in your benchmark, it's not worth thinking about. But then the benchmark becomes kind of its own narrow task. And then you find where we train a deep learning uh, system on you know 90% of that data, we test it on the remaining 10%, and lo and behold, it, it does well in that kind of narrow task. And you're still left with this kind of doubt. Yeah, so we solved the task, we solved the benchmark, we solved the data set, but did we actually solve the underlying problem? And often we find the answer is no, right? It's brittle, then we make a little change, and all of a sudden it falls apart, right? Uh, so so I, I do think we need to go beyond this you know, one data set, uh, one problem at a time to build something that cuts across multiple problems. But where are we going? Where are we going beyond benchmarks? Who's who's actually doing something that you think has a a possible chance of being part of this near future system that will have common sense or something approximating it? You know, it, I, I take it you're skeptical that it's going to be a bigger language model. So, um, again, uh, Eugene Choi and her team in the project called Mosaic is building a massive resource of common sense knowledge, a repository, so you don't have to relearn it uh, every time. Is this like Doug Lynette's, like big collection of statements? So it's analogous to Doug Lynette's uh, psych project, uh, which went over many decades, but there are several key differences. First of all, Psych was a heavy logical system, and this is a much more modern system with elements of crowdsourcing, text, uh, uh, model generation. But it is still sta- a big collection of common sense statements, right? It, it, it is. It is. So in that sense, it's analogous. The second thing is the Psych project, uh, at some point, I think it was in the 90s, gave up on the academic community on careful experimental measurement, whereas the Mosaic project continues to produce new algorithms and innovations and to be uh, both measurable and open. Another thing about Psych is it was always hidden from view. It was a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. This thing is amazing. Trust me, trust me. But no, you can't look uh, behind the curtain. And, and I realize these are uh, strong statements. But I do, I do just want to give a, a nod to the fact that it was the right idea, at least uh, in your mind, of collect common sense as a, uh, a very literal sense of statements about the universe. Uh, absolutely true. I think D- Doug Lenard and his team, the psych team, deserve a lot of credit for their courage to tackle this holy grail problem uh, Yeah, in the 80s. And they did it with, with the methodology at the time. I think they kind of lost their way over the years. Uh, and so we've picked up the baton and other people uh, in, in the community. I, I also want to just mention that another data set that we have, which is called, I think it's the um, Norm Bank, is a, a data set of little kind of uh, vignettes or snippets uh, with questions like, is it okay to mow your lawn at five o'clock in the morning? Or, you know, is it okay to kill a bear? Is it okay to kill a bear to uh, save your child? Is it okay to kill a bear to amuse your child? all kinds of little uh, short scenarios like that, and a label that says, yes, it's okay, it's not okay, it's not desirable, et cetera. And that's and, part and of where, the... And where'd the labels come from? Um, so, so they've come from uh, people and also from collecting efforts uh, done by other people. We've, we're always trying to am- amalgamate and bring in uh, resources created by others. To, and then, of course, uh, give them back to the community. So we've created the, the most powerful resource for training uh, starting to train ethical AI systems. So let's dig into that a little bit. This is this is really interesting. So I can imagine you can have uh, what you're generating is gold label data. You know, like we know and love across all of AI, but it has an unusual property, which is that at the decision boundary, there are going to be ambiguities where people disagree, and there's no amount of consensus that will get you to agreement. There are statements that people simply disagree on, and they always will. What do you do with that? That's actually a really unique kind of data. It has built-in permanent ambiguity. You're, you're exactly right, right? With a science question or math question, there's one right answer uh, typically, certainly when we're doing with grade level uh, science. Uh, not the case here. And actually, the system that we built on this, which is called Delphi, it was, um, it's available actually, a demo at delphi.ilnai.org. So again, uh, open it up and you can see 
uh, with some effort, it's quite easy to trip it up, get it to say the wrong thing. Well, uh, when you ask Delphi a question, uh, it can actually relativize its answers. It can say, if you're a conservative, you would think this. And if you're a liberal, you would think that. So it's starting. Yes, yes. So, so um, right. It tells you that. And you can pose the question. You say, uh, I, I don't want to get into controversial or painful topics, but you take abortion. Right. And uh, it, it'll, it, it, it has learned a model of the conservative view of abortion, of the liberal view. Uh, again, it, it has a long way to go, but it's exactly a, a platform to study the ambiguity that you were talking about. How do you, so I, I'm about to ask you a question in knowing full well that you've been sort of dragged through hell and back uh, in relation to the Delphi, Delphi uh, project, but zooming out just a little bit, how do you, how do you make productive progress on areas like this that you know are just fraught. You know that people are going to be upset. You know, any anything where you have a language model saying things like this is right or wrong according and if you're a liberal or a conservative, someone's going to get upset. How do we how do we make that okay to do that research knowing that you're treading into a, a bit of a minefield? Like I can imagine one extreme is we just don't ever touch that stuff. But I know how you feel on that topic. That's you're you're leaving gold on the floor. You're you're, you're just yeah. It's it's not just gold. Is um, I, I think that science is really hampered if there are questions that are uh, third rails. Right, we're not allowed to study uh, how do we build ethical AI systems because people will get upset. I think that's uh, that's highly problematic. And you're right that when we released Delphi uh, to the public, and we probably could have done better in terms of putting uh, warning labels on it, make sure you know that this is not the be all and end all. This is a research prototype meant to uh, you know for open inquiry and so on. But uh, people did get upset, and I would say two things. First of all, this is a great illustration of uh, the the adage where companies won't. If we were uh, Microsoft, or Google, Amazon, worried about our brand. We wouldn't do that. Look what happened with Tay, right? It was uh, taken off and there hasn't been, you know, Tay 2.0 and so on. You know, Microsoft. No, Microsoft hasn't touched that. <laughs> well, they have a brand to protect. I, I, I respect that. Uh, our brand uh, it does not need to be protected. It needs to be the spirit of, uh, of honest and open inquiry. And if we are alarming people, Actually, I think there's value to that. If you look at what neural networks do and you conclude, hey, this really needs to be uh, controlled better, then we've done part of our job, right? That, that's a good thing. So uh, I don't think that we court controversy, but we are steadfast in our support of, of open inquiry as opposed to some kind of uh, cancel this, don't do it, it's too, uh, it's too fraught. I do want to remind people in the audience, whatever their perspective is about the technology and about the effort, to remember that behind this technology, there are people, grad students, researchers, and those people have feelings. And, and I have to say, when all the negative energy towards Delphi came across, I, I felt bad. But I didn't feel bad because I was involved in releasing the project or people were upset. I felt bad for the people at AI2 who were the recipients of all this energy. And that energy, I think, could have been more uh, constructively targeted. I think anyone nowadays is very cautious about putting a language model out behind a, you know a text input portal anywhere on the internet and maybe that's one of the practical outcomes is that you just have to be very careful because it's all too easy to elicit offensive stuff out of this language model because it is a mirror of ourselves and you know we are offensive to each other and that's all baked into the language it learned from and so, yeah, I, it just seems like uh, there's just a lot of caution around doing what you do, which is to just be open with your work and put it out there as a prototype, warnings and all. I think uh, fewer and fewer entities in this space are uh, willing to take that risk. Well, I really hope that uh, we over the years uh, remain willing to do that appropriately. It needs to be done right. But there are people for whom it almost seems like a sport right, uh, to use your, your phrase from a previous conversation, a, 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 a sport to come and bash 
these sorts of efforts. And it, it's all too easy. I, I don't think it's it's sporting and uh, I don't think, uh, I think you can always do it. So I, I would not recommend to the Olympic Committee to include large language model bashing in, in the next Olympics. I, I would instead encourage the people who are uh, worried about that to engage with building better models, with building better controls, with uh, because these models are being built and AI is taking an increasingly uh, participatory role in society and decision-making. So we need to figure this out, not to bury the issue because it's, uh, it's too fraught. Last question, Oren. If you could time travel back those four years to when you, you know, said in that packed room to all these people, including me, you know, this stuff barely works. Um, what would you say today to, you know, this packed room, some tens of thousands of people listening right now, um, a lot of them hopeful and, you know, taking part in this revolution, which is absolutely underway. I mean, it's unbelievable what you could do today compared to four years ago. And who knows, four years hence. Has your advice changed? I would say that I, along with many people, have been surprised with the progress of the technology. So I would say uh, this stuff barely works, but I would add the proviso, but it's moving super, super fast. And then I would still add the cautionary notes, never trust an AI demo. And um, even if this looks very impressive, think about what's under the hood, what are the implications for society? Don't get caught up uh, in the hype, not the negative hype of the sort that Elon Musk spouts, but also not the positive hype of the sort, okay, we have achieved sentience. We have not. Thanks, Oren. Great talking with you. Thank you, John. A real pleasure.